Hello. Throughout this series of videos where I am rejecting the idea of truth in science, I've been merrily using the terms delusion, absurdity and paradox. In this my seventh video, it's high time for a recap. Now, in Science's First Mistake, the book I wrote with Dionysus the Metis, I contend that human con cognition conspires with memory in order to infer meaning onto what our senses tell us. That meaning is not observed truth, but is constructed out of the patterns we impose on our observations. I call these patterns delusions, although I do not use the word in any pejorative sense. It is merely my shorthand way of avoiding the necessity of making claims about truth in respect of what our human senses are telling us. In my videos, I have shown how some of these patterns are intrinsically absurd. But we humans still insist on using them. And why? Because they deliver useful analyses of the observed world. We go on to build very sophisticated constructions, both intellectual descriptions and physical artefacts, which are sufficient for the purpose and enable us to make our way successfully in the world. Science, mathematics and technology are among the most sophisticated of these constructions, and all of which are filled with absurdities, like the notion of infinity, and more of this in a minute. When building these descriptions, we must deny all the absurdities in their underlying patterns. Furthermore, because of the utility delivered by these constructions, far from ignoring the absurdities, we even make them an integral part of our sense-making in order to maximize the benefits that they deliver. This is why, in Science's First Mistake, Dionysus and I define intelligence as the ability to deny absurdity. However, the absurdities still remain buried deep in our descriptions, and they will resurface in certain situations, often in the form of paradoxes. Paradoxes are a harsh reminder that our descriptions are not truth, but are built upon delusions. To illustrate these ideas, I will now use some examples that I first came across as a first-year undergraduate studying pure mathematics. At that time, it didn't occur to me that the ideas being taught were in any way bizarre. In fact, they all made perfect sense to me. I was told about multiple infinities, starting from Piano's axioms, the class soon reached Cantor's countably infinite sets, those normally associated with the positive integers. That is, its members can be counted one at a time, although the counting never finishes. In other words, a hypothetical superhuman observer is needed to count as the numbers tend to infinity. Close on its heels came other different and larger types of uncountably infinite sets, each of which contain too many elements to be countable. I realise now that I should have queried all the absurdities, but at this stage in my mathematical education, I had become habituated I was aspiring to be a member of the elite club of mathematicians. It didn't occur to me to question the credo. Nietzsche put his finger on the problem that passed me by. Our fundamental tendency is to assert that the falsest judgments to which synthetic a priori judgments belong are the most indispensable to us, that without granting as true the fictions of logic, without measuring reality against the purely invented world of the unconditional and self-identical, without a continual falsification of the world by means of numbers, mankind could not live. That to renounce false judgments would be to renounce life, would be to deny life. 
I was totally taken in by those fundamental fictions and had become a pious believer in the truly wonderful mathematical ideas being laid out before me. As for paradoxes, they were mysterious wonders, an in-joke placed there for the amusement of mathematical insiders. Not anymore. Now I view paradoxes as a direct result of taking something absurd and treating it as being sensible. For example, write down the countably infinite sequence 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 plus 1 minus 1 and on and on and on. Now let's do the impossible and add up the sequence. Call it S. Now absurdly write down the same sequence but move every entry one place to the right so that the first one comes under the first minus one. Then the first minus one comes under the second one and the second one comes under the second minus one and on and on. Now adding these two lines together we get 2s equals 1 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 plus 0 and on and on and on. In other words 2s equals 1 and hence s equals a half. A paradox. A sum of integers is a fraction. What a great joke. Mathematics even proves that the set of all positive even integers and the set of all the odds is the same size as the set of the positive integers. Take any positive integer and multiply it by 2. It is now in the set of even integers. Then add 1 and the result is in the set of positive odd integers. So there are no more numbers than there are even numbers or odd numbers. All three sets are the same size. How very odd, because in the finite case of integers up to 2n, uh, there are n even integers and n odd integers, but 2n integers, twice as many. But as n reaches infinity, the sets suddenly become the same size, another paradox. Of course, the word size and n becoming infinity are the problems here. But the concept of infinity was invented in order to distract attention away from the problems that arise when arithmetic breaks down and size has no meaning. This is the case with Hilbert's hotel paradox. This states that a fully occupied hotel with a countably infinite number of rooms can still find rooms for additional guests. Suppose all of the countably infinite number of rooms are occupied. A new guest arrives and wishes to find a room. No problem. Simultaneously move the guest currently in room 1 to room 2, the guest in room 2 to room 3 and so on. All the original guests have been moved, leaving room 1 empty, so the new guest can move in. We can even accommodate a countably infinite number of new guests. Move the person occupying room 1 to room 2, the guest in room 2 to room 4, and in general the guest occupying room n to room 2n. Now all the odd numbered rooms, which as we have seen is countably infinite, are free for all the new guests. Of course no one mentioned the absurdities of a hotel with an infinite number of rooms and of communicating simultaneously with the infinite number of guests so they can move rooms. The absurdities get far more subtle in the way mathematics deals with the concepts like point and line and plane, abstractions at the core of geometry and mathematics, which would certainly not have originated if it had been known from the beginning that there is no exactly straight line in nature, no real circle, no absolute measure, and indeed no point in nature. Points, lines, circles and planes can only exist as abstractions, which is another word for delusion. For our sins we both live in and are trapped in three dimensions. They can only be imaginary and thus paradoxical excursions into lower or higher dimensions. All are flights of fancy, and yet to listen to physicists and mathematicians, there is nothing absurd about entering higher or lower dimensions. 
you can deny such absurdities as much as you like. Indeed, you can insist that these absurdities are sensible in order to develop sophisticated and useful theories. However, they will return as paradoxes to haunt those abstract theoretical descriptions. The only relevant question is, if the theories develop and deliver useful results, does the denial of the absurdities and paradoxes really matter? And the answer to that is, it depends. You never know until it does matter. For example, a point must be imagined into existence as both a more or less spherical dot, albeit a very small blob and for the practical purposes of calculation, one that has no size, no dimension, no substance. Now, how absurd can you get? The point is simultaneously there, but not there. A zero-dimensional object floating in 3D space. One that can be located, but with no physical presence at that non-existent location. It's a paradox. A line must be imagined as a very thin rectangle in an imaginary two-dimensional sheet. That too must be imagined as a rectangular block in three dimensions, with length but very small breadth and depth. For if it had no breadth or no depth, it would disappear. The trick for the mathematician is to keep all the images in mind to remain in three dimensions with the dot, the block and the thin sheet in order to stop the object disappearing, but to move seamlessly among the lower or higher dimensions, to undertake calculations without being dismayed by the absurdity of trans-dimensional travel. One of the most in useful inventions of such excursions is the real line. Not that there is such a thing as a line, but I'll let that pass. Each number is defined as a zero-dimensional point on the line. That real number being the distance of the point to the origin of the line. There are an uncountably infinite number of real number points on the real line. Such real lines are essential for setting up mutually perpendicular axes crossing at the origin with coordinate 0, 0, 0, so that all points in 3D space can be identified with the three coordinates. These numbers can be rational, namely they can be written as fractions, or irrational, those that can't be represented as fractions. They are normally thought of as decimals, the whole number part appears to the left of the decimal point and a countably infinite string of digits comes to the right. If the rightmost part of the infinite sequence is a repeating finite sequence, then that number can also be written as a fraction. It does raise the question of how we measure distance to an accuracy of an infinite number of decimal places, but we'll leave that. Mathematicians consider the part after the decimal point of real numbers as the set open square bracket 0, 1, close round bracket. This set is all the uncountably infinite real numbers between 0 and 1, but not including 1. You can always include 1 in the set by replacing the rightmost closed open round bracket with a closed square bracket. Now, Let's assume we have two neighbouring points on the real line, numbers alpha and beta. The number alpha plus beta over 2 lies somewhere between the two, so alpha and beta can't be neighbours. In other words, you can't fill a linear slice in one dimension with points of zero dimension without first postulating infinity and placing an uncountably infinite number of points between any alpha and beta. With the sleight of hand of using distance, you can now point at any zero dimensional object, which isn't there because it has no dimension, and even add it on to a one dimensional object, as for example, changing the right open-ended set 0 to 1 into a set closed at both ends. Absurd. But that absurdity is easily ignored. 
how easily the integers have become real number they're, they're real numbers by writing a decimal point after the integer and completing it with an infinite number of zeros to the right and then dropping it into the real line each integer now real number is simultaneously treated as both a discrete object a thing and a no thing without dimension without substance which as with the real number one in the example I've just shown can be tacked onto the end of a, a, a right open-ended line segment zero to one without extending the length in other words each real number is treated as both the presence of nothing and the absence of something formed by the paradoxical addition of a zero dimensional point onto a one dimensional line to smooth over the cracks mathematicians resort to their get out of jail free cards using phrases like tens to zero thereby enabling them to avoid any confrontation with the paradoxes resulting from transdimensional travel however if such ritual incantations do not work for you and you are troubled by such paradoxes if if you can't do the necessary mental gymnastics to somersault over the nonsense if the paradoxes uh, you cannot ignore the absurdities then mathematics is not for you uh, and this begs the question of what else has been imagined into existence when denying absurdities but no matter thankfully repeated use of the tricks breeds contempt for the paradoxes and absurdities and the utility that comes with the tricks only serves to justify the contempt of course the originators of each trick were only too aware of their paradoxical nature but over time at first the majority of users forget and then eventually most latecomers never learn of the trick at all thus the absurdities lie buried deep beneath familiarity but what if the context is such that the absurdities can't be ignored particle physics is a case in point researchers in this field are operating at such a minuscule scale that the notion of dimension has become destabilized as the difference between nothing and something in three dimensions becomes fuzzy it is pertinent here that we mention the Planck length roughly 1.616252 times 10 to the minus 35 meters which it is claimed is the smallest measurement of any length with any meaningful interpretation so how then can calculus include distances that tend to zero other than by inferring lengths that are meaningless paradoxically calculus itself was involved in calculating the value of the Planck length <laughs> would it be mischievous to suggest here that many of the phenomena being observed at the limits of observation are actually the products of the notion of a point being absurd and not of observation itself many researchers at the cutting edge are sensitive to this possibility which is why they stress that they are working with theories and not truth in other words they acknowledge the absurdity built into their theorizing meanwhile the legions of second division scientists speak only of empiricism the reality of their experiments and the search for a theory of everything not that there is such a thing as reality or absolute truth nevertheless truth is often presented as an objective description of an observed situation however that truth must involve a denial of the unobserved absurdities that are ever present in any analysis of observation and there is no avoiding the absurdity in the way we humans think all that I know is that I know nothing. Thank you.